committee is in order. Fiscal year 20 budget hearing for the Government Accountability Office. Uh, today we have two hearings. First is the GAO and the second is the Government Publishing Office. Uh, we're pleased to welcome Mr. Gene Dodaro, the esteemed Comptroller General of the United States, along with his team to testify on the fiscal year 2020 budget request for the Government Accountability Office. Congress needs your agency's neutral expertise these days more than ever. With the complexity of federal programs and tax policy threatening to overwhelm Congress's capacity to perform adequate oversight. We know we sometimes overtax you with our constant requests for reports, but GAO and the agency IGs are really our principal source of analysis that are needed for responsible policymaking. Your budget request is an ambitious $58 million increase, or almost 10 percent above your fiscal year 2019 level. We'll have to hope that we receive a healthy enough 302B allocation to be able to address it. Mr. Dodaro, before we ask you to proceed with the summary of your written uh, statement, I'd like to ask our ranking member, Ms. Herrera-Butler, if she has any opening remarks she'd like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I would also like to welcome our distinguished guest. I'm excited to hear exactly what the Comptroller General <laughs> uh, of the United States does. Um, I've seen some information, but I'm, I'm interested in hearing this. Um, the GAO often, uh, I, I have myself cited it as a watchdog in many a hearing. Uh, we all do. We rely on what you do. And I think what most of the public doesn't understand, you're tasked with investigating how well or how inefficiently we do our jobs. I mean, I feel like you're a very critical piece of what we do. Um, uh, I've seen estimates from your office that say for every dollar invested, 124 of potential savings government-wide is identified, which totaled over $75.1 billion in fiscal year 18 alone. So your budget request is, uh, wow, 647.6 million with a 9.8% increase over last, over last year's enacted, and we will see $80 billion in savings to the government because at least based on the numbers I was just looking at, will we see that $80 billion in saving to the government based on, on that request? And I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning to you, Ranking Member Herrera Butler. Good morning, Congressman Ruppersberger, Congressman Newhouse. Good to see you again, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the support that this committee has given us, and I believe that we've provided a great return on that investment. Uh, the, uh, for the last five years, uh, we've returned over $100 for every dollar invested in GAO. The last couple years, as you cited, uh, Ms. Herrera-Butler, it was uh, over $124 for every dollar invested in GAO. So we, we provide on a consistent basis a sound return on financial benefits to the government. But beyond that, you know, we uh, also produce a lot of other benefits for the government and public safety, national security, and other issues, since our scope is the entire scope of the federal government's operations. Last year, for example, based on our work, Congress gave legislative direction to VA to improve their appeals process, also to uh, retrofit facilities for more women veterans uh, that are that are in uh, need. Uh, also, it directed DOD to come up with a plan to improve military readiness. I've been very concerned about military readiness, and it's required GAO to monitor DOD's execution of that plan over the next five years. So that will be a big part uh, of our activities over that period of time. Also, I was pleased that the Congress, based on part on our work, passed the Disaster Response Recovery Act, which allows for uh, more funds to be used for mitigation and resilience building ahead of time, which is, we believe, a prudent way for the Congress to go in that area. We've also pointed out a wide range of other uh, things that need attention. For example, VA needs to improve its suicide prevention efforts. We've made recommendations there. Uh, states need more guidance on how to deal with substance abuse infants, and based on our work, we've encouraged that. We also have done work uh, that Congress passed legislation on elder abuse, and our recommendation was to collect more data so that uh, the government could come up with better prevention strategies in the future uh, to deal with that issue. Uh, based on our work, uh, ONDCP, Congress directed them to come up with better measures 
to gauge progress in addressing the opioid epidemic. So our work touches everything from defense to health care. Uh, we're asking, as you mentioned, for an increase uh, for next year to $647.6 million. Uh, we believe that this will enable us to meet the highest priority needs of the Congress. We continue to serve over 90 percent of the standing committees of the Congress and most of the subcommittees. So we get on average about 800 requests a year from the Congress. Uh, we uh, tackle them in priorities, <laughs> in what's in statute or conference or committee reports, priority one requests from committee chairs and ranking members, same priority, priority two. Uh, and then priority three is requests from individual members of Congress. But we haven't uh, had enough resources to do that for about 15 years. So right now, in order to get access to our services, it needs to be a committee uh, at, a, at a minimum or something in, in statute. I'd like to do more, uh, but we just don't have the resources. So I've been meeting, I meet with on a regular basis with all the committee chairs and ranking members to try to help set priorities for their requests and to help make sure we're focused on their priorities, but I have a clear sense of what they are and they understand what the trade-off decisions are if they want something uh, different, mm -hmm. if an emerging issue comes up. Uh, now, what we would use uh, the money for, uh, the additional funds, there are four areas that we are increasing our resources, but I believe need even more resources. First is science and technology uh, issues. Uh, this is something that we've been working on for a, a, a while now. We have just uh, created a new team to give it more profit, prominence to deal with science, technology assessments, and technical assistance to the Congress. Science and technology is evolving so fast that, that there's, I, I think Congress needs more help and more assistance understanding the ethical, legal, and regulatory uh, uh, aspects of these science and technology issues, whether you're talking about artificial intelligence, blockchain, quantum computing, uh, brain augmentation, and a uh, wide range of, of other issues. And so we have the capacity to do that, and we're building more capacity to help the Congress in that regard. Second, cybersecurity continues to be a huge risk. We labeled this a high risk area across the entire federal government in 1997. And uh, we've been uh, warning people for a while. We've added critical infrastructure protection beyond the, um, uh, the federal government systems and needs to be more uh, uh, effort there. And we've also encouraged the Congress to pass comprehensive privacy legis legislation framework for the private sector. I mean, only health care and uh, credit uh, reporting agencies are covered. There's really no, particularly for information reselling and all sorts of other, other issues in that area. Third is defense. Uh, Congress continues to make huge investments in the defense area, and we want to make sure that we are on top of that. We get dozens of mandates every year in the defense authorization and appropriation bills for work uh, requesting GAO's assistance, and so we spent a lot of time on that. Uh, last, fourth is health care. Health care costs, aside from interest on the debt, are the fastest growing portion of our government. Uh, you know, it's about a trillion dollars uh, spent uh, this past year on Medicare and Medicaid alone. Uh, and uh, it's been on our high risk area for a number of years, both Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, the, the Congress needs to address this issue on payment policies and try to come up with, uh, you know, reductions in, in health care expenditures because it's really not on a sustainable long-term path. I mean, the number of beneficiaries, and I can talk more about this in q and I don't want to use up all the time now, but I, I, could, I could talk for an hour on health care alone. Uh, but the number of beneficiaries are growing exponentially as the age, our population ages. And we're going to a stat in the next, uh, Right now, there's only 2.8 people working for every one retired person in the United States. We're going to where it's going to be two people working for every one retired person in the United States. And the models that we have for Social Security and for Medicare uh, aren't going to be sustainable right now without attention from, and reform you know, by the Congress. And that's leading to a long-term unsustainable fiscal path for the federal government, which you know, we're the auditors of the federal government's financial statements. And for years, you know, I've been saying that's on an unsustainable long-term path. You know, by, you know, the interest on the debt just in the last two years alone has grown $120 billion. And, uh, it, you know, we're talking $360 billion this year. And 
uh, by uh, 2029, within 10 years, interest on the debt alone, CBO estimates, could be $928 billion. I mean, it'd be knocking on the door of a billion dollar or trillion dollars a year, excuse me, it just didn't pay the interest on the debt to service the debt. And by then, Medicare and Medicaid each will be a trillion dollars by themselves. So that's three trillion. And Social Security right now this year is over hit a trillion dollars in spending. So you're talking before you fund anything else in the federal government, interest on the debt, health care, and uh, Social Security is uh, going to be four trillion dollars just as opening bid on those issues. So four trillion. Four trillion. Each one will be, you know, close to, if close to or at a trillion dollars uh, by that point in time. Uh, now, in the, the Medicaid will be some, that's counting state money too, as well as federal money. But, you know, GAO, uh, we take our job very seriously. Uh, we're also rated as the best place to work in the federal government. Uh, we are number one in rated across federal government, our commitment to diversity and in inclusion uh, in the government. Uh, we have tremendous, dedicated, talented people. We have no problem hiring people. I spent a lot of time going around to colleges and universities, and uh, we have a national recruiting program, and uh, so we, we have no, no problem getting top-tier talent in the federal government. Do you consider running for president with all of that? Uh, <laughs> I, no. <laughs> I, I like my career. I like my, I love my job. <laughs> But uh, so, you know, I'm here to ask for your continued support. Uh, I believe we'll provide a great return on investment. And, uh, you know, particularly, I know there's been a debate in the past about whether to reinstate OTA, uh, Office of Technology Assessment, or provide more resources to GAO. I'm here to assure you that we're prepared, if you decide to go that way, uh, to uh, handle those additional responsibilities. You know, we've been doing technology assessments since 2002. I've built the capability to do that at GAO and to do more work in that area. And so I'm uh, you know, very much looking forward. It's a high priority for me because I believe we need to do, uh, have more science capabilities and technical capabilities. I mean, Congress asked us to look at the new Columbia class nuclear submarine. I have people, I need people to understand that technology. Mm -hmm. you know, we're spending over $300 billion to refurbish our nuclear uh, arsenal. I need people to understand how to do that particularly sophisticated computer modeling. Uh, you know, as Congressman Newhouse knows, the uh, you know, disposal of radioactive waste, and we do a lot of work at Hanford. We have a site there we do so much work. Uh, is another area, healthcare, we're doing work on antibiotic resistance bacteria and other vaccines that need to be done. And so th th this is an area where GAO has been and will continue to grow to meet our full range of services but we can also meet the technology assessment and technical assistance to the Congress. We have a plan due uh, to the Congress next month that was required by this committee last year on a plan on how to expand our technology and assessment work uh, in, in the future. And so we'll be submitting that plan on time next month and uh, I look forward to your consideration. I know you'll give careful consideration to our budget request and I thank you for that, and I'm prepared to answer whatever questions you, you may have. I, I just want to say thank you to you. I'm from our meetings in my office and the hearings I've, I've been here with you. I just want to say thanks. I, it's uh, unbelievable your uh, team and your ability to communicate to us what we need to do. And when we're looking at the trajectory of the country, with the, the spending and the programs that need reformed and updated, um, you're really providing the, the roadmap for us. So um, we appreciate that. I know uh, I, I'm gonna yield to my, uh, my colleague here. I know she may have to step out at some point early, so I wanna give her an opportunity to ask some of the first few questions and take as much time as you need. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that. Um, well, you know, I could listen to you talk about healthcare for an hour. I would love to, to dig deeper. And so I will ask you a few questions along that route and along the debt service and kind of some of the debt issues that we're looking at. 
but I would ask that you it would come in um, and spend some time with me in my office um, to go over those a little bit more in detail so I can not belabor, <laughs> you know, I ask I'm, a lot I'm of questions. I'm down for it too, I'll come to the meeting. The, I think just think it would be very, me. very helpful. And that is ultimately, you know, some of these other things I think are critical, I think you laid out very well I was sitting here going, science and tech, not like, what's he do there? And then you give us a couple examples. Okay, that makes sense. Um, but I think in terms of just overall fiscal policy for us, I'd like to talk a little bit about the tax bill. I'd like to talk about CBO um, and assessments. And I, I know that I saw their 2029 projection with regard to debt service. Uh, I had some questions there that I'm sure you can answer. Um, and then in, in addition, the, the Medicare, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security pieces. So I just wanted to put that on there, that I'd like to do that. And, and so someone back there, I'm sure, is writing it down. Yeah. I think all of them did. <laughs> <laughs> and then whatever Very else sounds team, interesting. <laughs> and they're all happy. Look at them. <laughs> um, so with that, uh, I did want to ask, um, along the lines of disaster funding, Another small topic. Uh, um, 14 million was provided to GAO in the hurricane supplemental to help prevent fraud, waste, and abuse and to evaluate overall federal response and recovery efforts. And obviously our rating, our grade on how well we've responded to some of these disasters is still very much in question. Um, so I'm curious what the status of the G of GAO's work on the 2017 disasters is and and what, you, what, what can you share with us so far? I'll be happy to. Uh, uh, we so far have issued eight reports on the uh, disaster-related assistance that was provided for the 2017, both the uh, hurricanes as well mm -hmm. as the wildfires in, uh, in so, California. So uh, Sandy. No, it's not Sandy. Oh, Sandy it's, was 16. It's, uh, um, yeah, Sandy's Harvey, been a while back. Gosh. Harvey, Maria, and yeah, Irma. Okay, okay. Irma, Irma. and then the wildfires. Yeah, yep, okay. right, and the wildfires. Uh, we've issued reports on the federal government's initial response to those areas. Mm -hmm. uh, we've issued a follow-up report on Puerto Rico in particular mm -hmm. and some of the challenges they face. Just uh, two days ago, we issued a, a similar report on the Virgin Islands in terms of their mm -hmm. status as well. We've issued a number of reports on uh, contracting uh, for assistance. First, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of advanced contracts that are supposed to be in place to be used by the federal government to help move quickly in those mm -hmm. areas, you know, so you wouldn't have to put things out for bid. I mean, it's already, you got contractors lined up. Uh, there's improvements that they can make. We made nine recommendations in those areas. We're looking at the mm -hmm. post-contracting areas for disaster assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have a report coming out soon with 10 additional recommendations on improved contracting. So the federal government, you know, uses the money, Congress appropriates it in a wise manner in the contracting mm -hmm. area meets all the requirements, but they move quickly. We have uh, 25, over 25 other audits already underway because there's a long tail to the disaster recovery. There's the initial response, mm -hmm. but recovery takes many years. Mm -hmm. As you know, we, mm -hmm. Sandy just finished up not that long ago in that area. So we're looking at the uh, electricity power grid mm -hmm. situation in Puerto Rico. A lot of the housing issues, you know, particularly in Texas and in and, and, and that area where they were hit. Uh, and uh, we're looking at the Small <laughs> Business Administration with what mm -hmm. they've been doing to help small businesses. And there's a wide range of other audits. So we, so far we've used 5.6 million of the 14 million. We expect that we will use the remainder of that by the end of uh, next uh, year. This, so fiscal 19? Fiscal 19, you yeah, this, okay. this year, I okay. guess I should, this is, this year, this year. Wow. yeah. Okay. But we're, uh, um, but we're well on our way in that area, and uh, we're, you know, happy to, to take on additional responsibilities to look at the 18 disasters as well, both in Florence and Michael, you know, those, those hurricanes, because they were different types of, of issues, will have different types of effects. We've done a lot of work in this area, and, uh, we have on our high risk list a related issue, mm -hmm. which is um, limiting the federal government's exposure by better managing climate change risk. Mm -hmm. And so we put that, I put that on in 2013, I believe. And so we've encouraged the government to do more in terms of mitigation and, and resilience building up front, because a lot of these things could be avoided. 
Our report this year mm -hmm. on initial government's response showed that Florida was better positioned than any anybody yeah, else that would make because sense. they had worked to raise change building I, codes yep. and do standards. And, and whereas when you had Puerto Rico on the other end of the spectrum that really wasn't prepared at all. I, well, I'm, I'm reading a, kind of a history on, um, on Katrina. And then you compare, and I was watching uh, something on the Florida's preparedness and just the different planning, uh, say nothing of Puerto Rico. I also wanted, so when you mentioned the climate change piece, mm -hmm. though, I wanted to ask about mitigation with regard to forest management. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's a piece of what you're looking at, because I live in the West, yeah, we okay. have federal, I'm actually downstream of that nuclear power plant, yeah. so very interested in that as well, but yeah. um, the, our federal forests and what happened in California in Paradise and then what we see as possibly happening in and around just even my region. Mm -hmm. um, and we see with regard to the difference between state lands, DNR lands, private lands, right. and federal right. lands, and I have had you know, former um, DNR, I've had, uh, not DNR, excuse me, Fish and Wildlife and uh, Chief Forester, everybody from the feds come out and walk through those three different landscapes yeah. in the same area, and you just know that we're ripe for a horrible disaster, yeah. and I'm curious about uh, that piece. Yeah, we've done you. work in the past on, uh, you know, the... Uh, you know, control burns and trying to get rid of the underbrush and things like that. And I'm not sure whether we're currently selective focused harvest on that, but we we will go. I'll go back and make sure we are focused on that area. I just think I think well. if you're talking about as someone who live we live yeah. and breathe it, and it's a part of our heritage, we want to protect it. Mm -hmm. It's it, climate change isn't the only piece. Right. It, it would be silly to think it was. Mm -hmm. You recognize that once man has touched a forest, it's never going to go back to pre. Right. Uh, you know, are, are messing around with it, right? So mm -hmm. then there's a responsibility to, for a healthy ecosystem, and you really can see the difference in the three. So I'd be right. curious to hear, too, what your team is doing in that area, especially with kind of your look at the climate piece. Yes, we're looking at forest management <laughs> issues. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I did, uh, <laughs> breaking news uh, here. I, I, uh, I, that might also uh, be another area so where we can we, talk when about. When we get together, <laughs> yeah. we'll talk about specifically right. what we're doing. The one thing I want to mention, on you mentioned the debt thing. Just one thing I want to oh, put yes. on your radar I'm sure screen. we can talk about that for a while. Yeah, but just one, right now, it's timely, is the uh, debt ceiling suspension yeah. period is off this Saturday. Uh, Congress it, it, it took the debt ceiling off, which means the Treasury Department, as of March 2nd, will not have enough money to pay the federal government's bills on time unless it goes to what they call extraordinary, extraordinary measures. measures. What have they been? Um, which is, which become have be, yeah. unfortunately become all too ordinary. It's true. Uh, and so they borrow against the uh, government's pension systems, and there's other things they could take. Now CBO estimates that through these extraordinary measures, they'll have enough money uh, to last maybe until the end of this fiscal year, mm -hmm. you know, in September. But I urge Congress to take action. I've also made recommendations that Congress change how this whole debt ceiling thing works. Right now, it does nothing to control the debt. Mm -hmm. When it's, uh, Congress doesn't raise it on time, the markets get nervous, so they demand an additional premium. So it costs us more in interest to borrow money mm -hmm. during a period of time. And the markets now are distorted because they're avoiding purchasing securities that might expire during a debt impasse period. Mm -hmm. And so it's affecting liquidity in the secondary market. So there's nothing to it helps like. no one. Uh, it helps no one. Uh, in this process. So I've made some recommendations on different ways that that could be dealt with uh, over time. Because we, I am, you know, very concerned. We never do anything to affect the full faith and credit of the federal government. Good, uh, thanks. You know. I mean, we could talk about that forever. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Sure. Area one uh, is that uh, the Congress could use the budget resolution process to raise the debt ceiling. Right now, the, the budget resolution process <clears throat> does, you know, is mostly focused on the annual appropriation figures, but two-thirds of the federal government spending right now is sort of on automatic pilot on Social Security, Medicare, whatever. But the congressional uh, budget resolution process ought to consider all the revenues coming in, just as you do in your family home. You figure out what your expenses, what your revenues, and how much you'd have to borrow. And so that could be number one option. Number two option could be that authority be given the executive branch to uh, 
notify Congress that it needs to borrow more money and to go up to raise the ceiling, and Congress could disapprove it. So in other words, Congress wouldn't have to proactively act unless they, they disapprove that process. Uh, and then third would be to give the executive president the authority, because Congress is appropriating the money. Right, right now, the debt ceiling only deals with paying bills that Congress has already appropriated. So it's an after-the-fact measure. Uh, and so you could just say, okay, Congress, in deciding its appropriations, decides by de facto how much the government would have to borrow, and you just authorize the executive branch to borrow that amount of money. Could you, do you have a paper on that? Yeah, I have reports. Send it to, sure. To us? Yeah, I'll okay, send thanks. it to all of you. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, and there's some, we've been working with some member offices on, on proposals uh, to deal with that. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. All right, the two areas I want to get into are the technology policy, mm -hmm. and then I know you, you had a couple of years ago, you had an issue with the intelligence community yeah. being involved. And, you know, I've been involved with intelligence my whole career here. And, uh, you know, the intelligence community is very sensitive about, about their classified uh, issues and mm -hmm. anyone else being involved. And your issue is trying to find a way to manage it and make sure it works better. Uh, but I'll get into that second. I want okay. to get into this first. Uh, you know, Congress uh, can use help to better understand a lot of the emerging tech policy, like privacy, cybersecurity, new space threat, hypersonic weapons. Uh, these are some of the current projects. Mm -hmm. um, and you have, is it, it's the newly formed Science Technology Assessment and Analytics Team. Is that yes. under you, right? Yes, that's under me. But I also have an Information Technology and Cybersecurity Team. Mm -hmm. So there are two, two teams to deal with the issues you're talking okay. about. Okay, well, um, how is that working at this point? Uh, I think it's working very well. What are you uh, doing then with that? Yeah, well, w with that, I mean, we're doing a lot of work. We just issued technology assessments on artificial intelligence. We've done uh, uh, or, uh, technology assessments on sustainable chemistry, uh, detecting explosive devices, on passenger rail, issues. biological technical issues. You yeah. know, we have the capacity to do this. I have a lot of people with science skills. I hired our first chief scientist in 2008, so I've been building his capacity for about 10 years now. We have a standing contract, too, with National Academy of Sciences, so we lose a lot of our experts to help in peer reviews and other, other activities as well. But I, in my prepared testimony, there's a list of all the technology assessments that we've done uh, and technology assessments that we have underway, uh, but we also use these people to look at a lot of different issues. And you mentioned hypersonic weapons. I mean, that's on our radar screen. So well, a lot of the defense work we do. My issue, yeah. you're doing this. Yeah. I would like to get some of this. And okay. I think other members, too. Sure. And like hypersonic, I've been focusing on for years. Okay. A very dangerous situation for right. us. Right. I agree. The sequestration, we're behind right. Russia and China, too. And there's an offense and defense. Right. But and same thing on artificial yeah, intelligence. Exactly. Too. Uh, I'm not, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I actually represent NSA, so I, I deal with a lot of that. And okay. They're pretty good. But on the other hand, you get into um, the other side and, and that has a lot of issues in Homeland Security. You know, they don't have enough people. They don't have the, the, the expertise. Mm -hmm. And they have a mission, which is really big. But yeah. I don't want to get in, into yeah. all that. Let, I want to get into the issue of um, our plan efforts. You know, your testimony talked about over the next two years, you have plan efforts, uh, <clears throat> include assessing the federal government's efforts to establish and implement comprehensive national cyber strategy mm -hmm. to evaluate government-wide initiatives to implement continuous diagnostic and monitoring capabilities and establish effective risk management processes at the federal agencies. Mm -hmm. Your testimony mentions the GAO's continued focus on the public-private partnership model. Could you go into more detail on this model? Yeah. Uh, it, it, there needs to be, I think, an emphasis on the importance of a clear and concise best practice guide for federal agencies. And will this assessment include the technologies used by federal agencies who deal with sensitive information? Yes. And, that, and yeah. you can throw in there, too. Yeah. I mean, our .gov, we're a long way off. Yeah. You have some departments that are good, others that aren't. There hasn't been any, any uh, maybe trying, but ability to pull that together yeah. to protect ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I testified before Congress last summer on all these issues. I'll be happy to provide my testimony. It was... Uh, the House uh, Oversight and Reform okay. Committee. Okay. Congressman Hurd uh, had held the hearing, okay. uh, and uh, and Connolly had been involved, Meadows and uh, Congressman Kelly. It was a joint hearing of two subcommittees. Okay. Okay. And uh, so I'll be happy to provide that. But on the partnership issue, the, the issue with the 
the private sector has most of the computer resources, as you know, yeah. for critical infrastructure protection. Right now, there are standards out there, but they're all voluntary. And the federal government really doesn't have a good idea on how implementation has gone of those standards, whether you're talking about the electricity grid, we've done work on that, financial markets, election systems, uh, telecommunications, there's 16 different critical sectors, in infrastructure sectors. And so our view is the federal government needs to know more about the status of implementation of cybersecurity best practices in those in the private sector in those sessions. Uh, sessions. Now, in some sectors, in some areas, the federal government has regulatory authorities, like in the nuclear uh, area as well. But many, it doesn't. And so it's relying on the dialogue between the private sector. Now, the federal government itself, my concern is they haven't acted with a greater a, a, a sense of urgency commensurate with the threat. And I've encouraged them to move faster. We've made in the last 10 years 3,000 recommendations. A thousand are still open, you know, or several hundred of them, almost 700 of them are open. And uh, we issue more every day. Uh, this is still a problem at virtually every federal agency uh, across the government in terms of protecting the systems there. And on the national, we need a national and global cybersecurity strategy. Which we need, we'll we probably we didn't bear it before that happens. Yeah, no. Nah, global side. Yeah, no, no, no. We, we need some cyber diplomacy. There, there are no international norms in this area. And so th this is an area that's really uh, very, very problematic. And on the privacy side, you know, our privacy law was passed in 1974. Uh, there was the E-Government Act in 2002, so we're way out of date in terms of protecting privacy. So we've had recommendations since 2013 for the Congress to pass a consumer privacy framework in the for the private sector uh, areas as well. We're going to have a second round, right? <laughs> yes. All right, well, I, 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 I would like you to get that information to me. Sure. And, uh, the other thing, uh, in my opinion, I believe just like we're focusing on prioritizing space, we need to prioritize cyber, and I would hope that we could have like a special combatant command or something. Mm -hmm. where you, you focus strictly on cyber offense and defense. So if you have any right. information on that, sure, that sure. We, have, we just issued a report not long ago about the lack of attention that DOD's been giving the cyber issue in the development of weapon systems. You can get that new to me. Yeah, yeah. No, you'll have all that today. Right. New House. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dodaro, thanks for being here with us. Thanks for bringing your crack team with you. Um, I, I do want to compliment you uh, on the work that you did on the um, uh, Department of Energy's efforts in cleanup of nuclear waste. I think that that is going to help us make sure that we're spending ta taxpayer dollars wisely. Uh, that's a huge commitment to, of the federal government. Uh, and uh, I think shining the light that you have on that will be helpful. Uh, uh, to make uh, not only get the cleanup done, but as efficiently as possible. So thanks, uh, you guys came in and helped explain that uh, to me. And uh, uh, that's maybe the not the message I wanted to hear, but we gotta we gotta uh, face face the uh, reality of what we're what we're doing. Um, I'm going to ask kind of a question that I should know. You know, this is my third term of Congress, and I don't. But you you alluded to the fact that. You work with committee chairs and ranking members. You don't have time for member requests. And so I got to thinking, well, you're, the, you're our watchdog in, in a lot of things we do as a government. Uh, and I'm assuming it's very intentional on the, the things that you look into, that you mm -hmm. assign to your staff to. But how does that happen? Do you, do you guys sit down in, in the morning have the, over a cup of coffee at the table and say, what are we going to look into today? Or, or is, it a, is it by request only from committees? Yeah. Or how does all that happen? How, sure. do, how do we intentionally look into the And how do you prioritize? Mm -hmm. and, and with that, you talked about the enormity of all the things that you're doing. <clears throat> there must be some your to-do list isn't empty, I'm sure. There's yeah, got to right. be a backlog here. And mm -hmm. maybe talk about how this request for your increase in your budget will help sure. along those lines. Sure. Uh, well, first, uh, 
in terms of planning, deciding what we do, we do a five-year strategic plan for serving the Congress and the oh, country. Right. So we get input from a lot of the congressional committees. I have outside advisors. We have experts in GAO. We have so we put that together. The last one we did was February last year, 18 for a five-year five, plan. A five-year plan, strategic plan for uh, serving the Congress and the country. Then we work with all the committees uh, on this issue now. They, I would say of the, say on average, the last five years have been about 800 requests, about 800. Uh, uh, committees? Uh, from the entire Congress. Oh, uh, members. They, yeah, member, well, there's some members, but 800, they could come, they come in a form of laws, you know, GAO sure. shall do this. Uh, committee conference reports, yeah. that's priority one. Priority two are requests from committee chairs and ranking members. You know, we treat both the same. We're a nonpartisan organization, and uh, and those are our two priorities. And then third, I mentioned, is individual member requests. But those, you know, we, we don't have resources to do. But many of them uh, get a committee to sponsor their request, so they get resolved. But of the, say, 800 we receive a year, I'd say about 75 percent of them are already contemplated in our strategic plan for serving the Congress. So I believe most of what we do, the vast majority of what we do, is a shared agenda. Congress thinks it's important. They've either put it in law or a committee conference report or sent a request in from a committee. Uh, and uh, we think it's important as so, well. So w would you analyze things without the request of Congress? Yes. You do. Yes, I do have authority to investigate anything on my own. I see. You know, authority. And I do use that selectively. The work we've done on the debt ceiling, I've, I did that on our own authority. That's about maybe 5% of our resources every year. Mm -hmm. uh, areas on the high risk area, like when we first did the cybersecurity, I did that on our own. Now it's requested every year. Uh, I, I uh, authorized a study on the problem in housing finance with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are still in federal conservatorship 10 years after the global financial crisis. It's an, an, all the risk now in the housing finance areas moved to the federal government. Uh, two-thirds of all individual mortgages now are either directly or indirectly supported by the federal government. You know, Ginnie Mae's portfolio has gone over $2 trillion. Federal Housing Administration's portfolio has increased. So th this is a big problem. Congress needs to solve this, this problem. So that, those are just two examples. I did one on retirement security here. I think we've got a looming problem, retirement security, but it changes not only in the government programs but the private sector dimensions and individuals own savings accounts. I did special one on DOD. I was concerned that we listed out their top priorities. I was very concerned, as I mentioned earlier, about readiness issues, cyber issues at DOD. That was under your own volition. Yes, that was under our own volition. Yeah, so I, I selectively pick things that I either think need to be, you know, sp cross committees jurisdiction. You know, a lot of these things span the various committees jurisdictions. Uh, or that I know nobody's going to ask us to look into because it's a hot button issue uh, okay. and I think needs to be dealt with. So I think we get the top priorities of the Congress, but we could do more with resources. You know, up until the mid 90s, we had uh, up to 5,300 people at the GAO. I mean, we were downsized to about 40% uh, mm -hmm. during that period of time. And uh, along with many other parts of the government, particularly the legislative support agencies for the Congress, that's when the Office of Technology Assessment was defunded uh, during that period of time. And so we used to we used to be able to handle a thousand, almost twelve, sometimes twelve hundred requests from the Congress uh, in a year. Uh, and so we we can scale up whatever the Congress decides they want to invest uh, in us. And we, we can uh, provide more, much more assistance, and we're capable of doing that. If, if so it sounds like I should get in the queue soon. <laughs> yeah. Well, there is a queue in some areas, yeah. and that's the ones I'm trying to increase. Healthcare, in particular, everybody's interested in healthcare and DOD uh, issues, uh, in particular. Cyber now and science and technology are becoming ubiquitous issues in almost every federal department and agency, federal programs. You know, we're talking about protecting electronic uh, health care records. Or, I mean, it, it's, it's become an integral issue, so those things are coming up. So we never say, I mean, the only time we say no to a request is if we don't have the authority to do the work. No. 
Oh. No, in most cases we'll say if you're priority one or two, uh, we'll accept it, but we you know, might have to wait four months before we can start it or something. That, that's the way the queue works. And so okay. we eventually get to everything that's a priority one or priority two request. But I've, I've went to, and this happened when, when the sequester hit back in 2013. You know, we lost 15% of our authorized staff during that sequester because of the government-wide cut. Now, I didn't lay off anybody. I didn't even furlough anybody for an hour. I adjusted. I made a lot of changes, but we couldn't replace people that left during that period of time. So we have now are creeping back up the last few years during that period of time. But to compensate, I went around to all the committee chairs and ranking members, and I said, look, I'm not going to sacrifice quality of our work. What we need to do is agree on your top priorities. I can't get to everything. And so that process has worked very effectively. Okay. So I, I, I think we're there. But we can obviously do more with more resources. And that's, you know, I, I could have had a, a bigger request to, to submit, but I understand as the auditor of the government's financial yeah. statements what kind of fiscal position we're in. So I want to be prudent uh, in, in submitting the request, which I, I think I have been. So I'm uh, part of a special committee to modernize the Congress. And uh, I can anticipate, we, I think we're having our first meeting today or tomorrow, but uh, I can anticipate that, that we might be wanting to uh, work together with you. Is that something that you have the bandwidth to do currently? Uh, uh, or uh, uh, this new yeah. increase would be helpful, I would think? Yeah, no, absolutely. We could deal with you. You know, my, I've been, and a lot of those things that you talked about, the you know, cybersecurity and sure. the technology and all the different things that we need to be looking at more. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. And we're looking right now at the request of uh, Appropriations Committee on cybersecurity for the new Office of Congressional Workplace, for example. And we've done work uh, within the legislative branch as well. But, I mean, one of the real challenges, I think, for you and, that, and your committee in that regard is I think the, the Congress has put itself an increasingly disadvantaged uh, position and providing oversight over the executive branch. You know, Congress has reduced its own staff, it's reduced staff in yeah. the legislative support agencies. And testimony for this committee over the years, I've always said that I, I think that that's a mistake to keep yeah. reducing that. You know, even at its height, the legislative branch is so outpersoned, if you will, compared to the executive branch, it's hard to conduct the oversight over those areas, and issues are happening more rapidly now in the development of science and technology issues, in particular cybersecurity threats, global issues, and other matters that the Congress right now needs to really, yeah. in modernizing itself, also look at what, what capabilities are really mm. required in order to exercise uh, the oversight contemplated by the Constitution mm. Uh, mm. in that area. And, and, and so I'd be happy to talk about any aspect of okay. what you're doing. Okay. I think it's that. vitally important to our country that Congress uh, look at these issues, and I'd be happy to do whatever I can to support it. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. Sure. And, and I would just uh, second that the request, oh, the Dutch is still here, but the request for information that you're going to send to uh, other offices sure. about, about our debt and uh, the, the, the uh, budget process and all that be very interested in. Sure. No, I'd be happy to do that. We'll, we'll get a package around everybody on the committee. Right. Good. All right, I, I would recommend, too, if you want to go down a rabbit hole, go on their website. And you the, the reports are so, um, they, they cover a lot of ground. I mean, the scope of the work is incredible and the detail is incredible. So you can get lost <laughs> just reading reports about what's inside his brain. <laughs> but, but, uh, it got so bad that when I read the reports, I hear them in your voice. No. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's a benefit of being a congressman. Right? <laughs> case. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on my colleague's line of questioning. Um, you And there's two parts to the question. First of all, you say that you do have the authority to be proactive in terms of initiating um, reviews, uh, that you primarily use that discretion for debt and budget ceiling kind of stuff, which, by the way, I completely agree with your exercise of discretion in that department. But you're mostly reactive to, to requests. So, that, so, so, the, so the question there is, um, what would you want somebody from Congress to ask you uh, to do? Uh, what's on your list that you want somebody to prioritize? And, and let me back onto that question by 
asking it to you made a comment right at the very end there about um, uh, Congress increasingly deferring to the executive branch and and I, I think many of us have been concerned about that. Um, I, I, I recall being in a briefing uh, with uh, several of my colleagues uh, by the CRS on a major issue. I think it was health care, if I'm not mistaken. This was a couple of uh, months ago. And, and there was a key set of assumptions in the briefing. And so somebody asked the obvious question, where did those assumptions come from? And they said they came from the administration. And, some, and that person said, well, how do you know those assumptions are correct? Mm -hmm. And CRS said, we don't. We're taking the administration's word for it. We don't have the capability to independently. Now, it's a big job to, right. to right. independently verify those assumptions. But it made me think, I mean, where are we in, in government um, deferring too much uh, to the executive? And I say this on a nonpartisan basis. Mm -hmm. just our job to check and balance them, right? They could yeah. be the best people in the world. We would still want to look over their shoulders. So big picture right. question. Um, what do you think we should be looking at, whether anybody has asked you or not, and uh, related, um, where do you think the, the um, areas of the executive branch um, basic assumptions that, are, that policy is being built on, mm -hmm. where are those areas that we should be looking more closely at? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of things. First, I don't want to leave the impression that we're reactive to most requests. Most of the requests of the 800 Three quarters of them are things we suggested the Congress, the committees. Well, I was trying us. to be polite. I assume the, you had a way of suggesting. Yeah, we a, do. A we do. Maybe uh, I was too nuanced okay. in my explanation. Okay. But uh, in those ones, we'll, we'll, we say we think this is important. They agree, and so then they they request it. So most of the big ticket items that I think Congress should be looking at, uh, we're looking at at that point. And then I fill in the gaps with our own authority. Now, in terms of areas though that need more scrutiny and looking at assumptions, uh, there are several I'd point to. Uh, one is uh, the increase the health care issue. You know, we have, I've increased our uh, actuarial support at GAO, so I've got now three actuaries, I've got a chief actuary. A lot of the assumptions there, uh, in terms of the actuarial assumptions that the government's making, need more scrutiny, whether it's in the health care area, uh, whether it's in the pension area, which includes VA, by the way, uh, they, be, they made a big mistake in their actuarial assumptions that we caught through our financial audits over there. I think the other area, and uh, uh, Congressman uh, Newhouse would know this, is, is in the assumptions on what to deal with all this radioactive waste that we still have stored. I mean, we don't have a final disposal site at, at this point in time. Uh, it's, it's growing. The environmental liability I added to our high risk list uh, last, uh, in 2017, it's almost half a trillion dollars right now. And that's understated. Nobody really knows what the full cost of mitigating both at the Energy Department and, and DOD really is. So much more needs to be done in that area. Uh, much more needs to be done in the pension benefit guarantee area. In fact, in that area, the multi-employer portion of that program is going to be potentially insolvent in a high degree of likelihood it will be insolvent by 2025, 26 these period are, these of time. These are policy judgments to be made. I'm, I'm kind of yeah. going one level down and okay. saying, are, are, do we have questions? Do you think we have yeah. questions or legitimate reasons to go after the assumptions on which those policy judgments are well, made? Yes. Nuclear, yes. waste, or right. pension? I, I think you've already said. Actuarially, yeah. I think you've said, yeah, we need to look at some of those yes. actuarial right. assumptions. Yeah. yeah, there's no question about it. I mean, I can give you a long list of those things for the record, but I mean, I mean, if I talk to our, our guys back at the GAO, you know, they, they would give you a long list of all these things that need to be looked at at that, at that sub-tier level. And it would, it would span most of the, the, the uh, departments and agencies in the federal government. Okay. And, and I think, I mean, you know, the other issue, I mean, you mentioned that. I mean, I, I think, you know, there was a real question of, you know, as we, we were $22 trillion now, we're going to be close to adding a trillion a year and then go over a trillion a year for the next 10 years. Uh, you know, uh, what are the assumptions about who's going to lend us the money and at what rate and how, what the mix of bills, you know, the type of debt instruments that should be used and how uh, we, we should go about paying down the debt at some point in time. I mean, there's really no plan right now to pay down. Is that a pending, the debt. Um, is that a pending study on your part? Or your, no, I don't have that one yet. We're going we're gonna to look more in the debt management okay. issue. I mean, I have that on the, on the agenda. 
interesting to, to do that. And but, then switching, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I, I mean, the, the other area, you know, we need to look more at the assumptions is at EPA. Uh, you know, there's a lot of assumptions about the safety of chemicals that are made that are, aren't made without a lot of, uh, you know, scientific underpinning. They're way behind in doing scientific studies. Congress has given them new authority now to get more information from the chemical industry uh, than they had before. Before they had to prove something was bad that was on the market as opposed to pre-approve it beforehand. Uh, but they make a lot of assumptions that I think should be looked at with a lot more scrutiny because they have a lot of, of uh, safety implications for the American public, both short term and long term. And some of those issues you can't turn around overnight. And uh, so that's another area that comes to mind. Okay, thank you. One more, or do you want me to? Go ahead. Um, so I'm, I'm going to switch gears to recruitment because your uh, biggest request is 33 million for 100 FTEs, which is 330,000 per, which I assume is a standard unit of FTE salary and benefits. Um, so those folks would be at um, federal wage classifications or congressional wage. And I guess yeah. my question there yeah. is, um, although it's really good news that you are very highly, um, you know, sought after as a place to be employed. Um, we're talking about AI, machine learning, cyberspace. Mm -hmm. And I was just at DOD the other day, and they said one of their toughest challenges is recruitment in these exact areas because it's incredibly high demand for incredibly high mm -hmm. specialized people that can command a lot of salary. So, mm -hmm. I mean, somebody can want to work for you really badly, but if they're offered twice that or, or more in the private sector, how, how, do you, how do you handle that? Are you yeah. getting the... Are you able to recruit at the very top expertise, given that we need the top expertise to mm -hmm. be able to exercise our oversight function, or is there something different we should be looking at? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, you know, we, I don't have any problem with that, okay? But I go out, you know, I spent a lot, I was at Carnegie Mellon University. I was at uh, Arizona State recently, the University of Maryland, they have quantum computing. So, and I brought some of their professors in to meet with our people. We just hired 30 cybersecurity people. Now, they're not all, you know, experienced people, but they're, they're educated in cybersecurity, part of the cybersecurity core. We have, I mean, what I sell at GAO is the importance of our mission, all right, and the, the ability to make a difference and a good work-life situ balance situation at the GAO and a good place to work. It's a learning environment and other things, but you gotta sell these things. I find, you know, so I go out personally and I do a lot of selling about GAO and about the importance of working with us. Uh, I also use search firms uh, to hire more senior talent in that area. I hired our chief scientists uh, from the intelligence uh, community uh, through that vehicle. Uh, and uh, we're looking now for data science people and engineers, we got engineers, we got uh, chemists, we have uh, physical scientists and people who have nuclear engineering background. And, and I look for people also that are, that are uh, you know, aren't sat they aren't, a lot of people work in the private sector might get paid more money, but they're not as satisfied in some cases I, with, I, with, the, mm. with the type of work that they do. So I target those people and I don't need huge numbers, but I need the right person. So if you, if you market yourself properly and you target people who are likely to appeal to want to do public service, to work in a good professional, nonpartisan environment. That's a big part of what we sell. I get that. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure yeah. that is your number one yeah. term in, in, to include the quality of the workplace. And that, right. that comes through a lot and clear in, in your testimony. But I'm just realistically yeah. asking you the question, do you, do, you, do you have the expertise? And I'm not so much thinking about the recent Carnegie Mellon grad, although those yeah. are important folks, but right. maybe the per person 15 years out. Yeah who is, you know, like really at the top of their game, yeah. because I don't know what right. the Carnegie Mellon people do or don't know in their yeah. first couple of years. Right, right, yeah. No, no, we have those people too okay. at GAO. Now, is it, it, it you know, I don't, I'm not Pollyannish to know that, the, you know, I have all these people, but to, to supplement what we're able to do in that area, I have a standing contract with the National Academy of Sciences, all right? So I say, okay, I want to I wanna look at uh, nuclear waste disposal, oh. all right? Pull a panel together of the top experts in the country. And sometimes they'll even go abroad and bring people in. So we have access and use all these technical I see. resources. So outside. outside help. We use that on all our technology work. 
And we have the best, we have access to mm -hmm. all the top people and mm -hmm. whatever field we're looking at. Okay. And through that means to augment the, our own staff at the GAO. That's a very important component. Yeah, no, I should have asked whether you do that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah sure. Thank you, sir. Um, just a couple of a quick questions. Um, we know you were directed um, by CRS um, to contract for the National Academy of Public Administration study. No, we, we weren't. No. C CRS was. CRS was, and yeah. then they were going to get the report, and then, but the report's not in yet. Right. And you guys are moving forward, so the question I have is right. that without the report in hand yet, because that's the end of the year. Well, well yeah, I don't know when it's... Yeah, the, the, the CRS one's in the fall. So but that's going to come yeah. in the fall. You're right. kind of talking about moving forward. Can right. you just talk to us a little bit about um, what the complications are with moving forward without that report in hand? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I'm moving forward with the resources Congress gave us last year. Mm -hmm. you know, we're increasing uh, our information technology and cyber security team will grow from 140 to 175 people by the end of this year. Uh, we're also in, we have 70 people in the science technology assessments and, and analytical area, and I eventually want to grow that to somewhere between 100 and 140 uh, people as well uh, down the road. Now, we, we were asked, while well, Congress asked CRS to do this study of what congressional needs were, they also required us to make our team more prominent mm -hmm. and to get, submit a plan uh, to increase our capabilities uh, and that plan is due to be submitted to you and the committee next month. Mm -hmm. So you'll have our plan too. And so you can look at our plan and you can look at the other plan. But my belief is regardless of what you decide on the whatever study uh, CRS produces through NAPA, uh, we need to do this at GAO anyway mm -hmm. to, to do our work, uh, to, to provide proper service to the Congress. Now we can go further, mm -hmm. but what I'm building to right now we need Anyway. Anyway. Gotcha. Okay. Um, we heard uh, last year from public witnesses who urged the subcommittee to pass legislation to force the national intelligence agencies, I know Mr. Ruppersberger kind of touched on this, to share their data with you. And we'd like to ask you about that issue. You confirmed that your access was improving a bit, but that you really needed Congress to pass legislation requiring the intelligence agencies to cooperate. So we've tried this once before in the intelligence authorization bill uh, a few years back, but back down due to White House pressure. I'm assuming there will be White House pressure again. Do you have any uh, hope of a different outcome if we try to pass it? Yeah, well, uh, a couple things. One, I believe we already have the statutory authority to do the work in the intelligence communities. What we need is the support from the intelligence committees mm -hmm. Uh, and the cooperation of the intelligence community. Now, that has been steadily improving uh, since the directive came out a few years ago. You know, I worked with the General Clapper and his team to produce that directive. Uh, and I've met with Director Coates, and uh, you know, we're moving forward. We're looking at contracting issues right now in the intelligence community, onboarding of, of staff in the intelligence community, uh, and whistleblower uh, complaints in the uh, intelligence community, how they handle that, and among other issues. Mm -hmm. So we're getting more support from the intelligence committees. I think that's key mm -hmm. to us moving forward in the area. Now, is, is work there as smooth as it is in other parts of the federal government? No. Mm -hmm. and it takes more time, but they don't have as much experience working with us mm -hmm. as other departments and agencies of the federal government. So we're, we're getting in a rhythm with them. Mm -hmm. I could always use more support from the Congress uh, in, in that area, but I don't think we need statutory authority. We just need support from the committees, mm -hmm. the intelligence <laughs> committees. Uh, now, if Congress wants, uh, you know, we have more difficulty if the requests come from non-intelligence uh, uh, yeah. committees. Yeah. You know, but if we get it from the intelligence communities, uh, generally we can work it out. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, it takes longer to do that, to work out the issues uh, with them. Uh, but I would welcome whatever additional support. Well, we should have a conversation about that. I know yeah. Mr. Ruppersberger and I both sit on the Defense uh, Subcommittee of Appropriations, and there may be an opportunity for us to at least have that, that conversation. Sure. I look at your reports, and I 
see the work that you're doing and I hear your, uh, your testimony and your team's analysis of all of, of this, uh, it's generally and in particular, and just think with regard to the intelligence mm -hmm. community, uh, how valuable it would be for us to have, uh, have your eyeballs on that. Yeah. Uh, I think it would be very, very helpful. Well, I think we could do more, particularly in the management area and the investments that are made in that, in that yeah. area, and whether there's good return on the investments uh, in all cases. Uh, but we would need, and part of the resource request I have this year is to help get our people the necessary, you know, uh, class, uh, classification mm -hmm. and clearances uh, to be able to work right. in that area and increase the number of people. And if we move in that area, a lot of technical people that I have also will need to help mm -hmm. depending on the scope of the request. Yeah. A um, few more questions. Um, I know you talked about modernizing or... Uh, Newhouse talked about modernizing Congress, and I have been of the thought for some time now that the institution of Congress is not keeping up. You look what's happening in the private sector uh, with information flows and, and just the speed of things happening, and then you look at Congress, and it was designed to be a slower process. That mm. was it's inherent in the, in the Constitution. Um, six years in the Senate, two years in the House, you know, the initial reaction from the public versus the slower, longer view of the Senate uh, and an executive that's limited in their, should be limited uh, in their capacity to, to do things. And, and yet that design is not keeping up when you talk about cyber and AI and mm -hmm. being economically competitive with what China's able to do and, and focus on, and even, even the way our, our schedules are set up to come here three days a week. And, you know, the, the staff, uh, I'm glad you brought up the fact that the uh, staff has been cut. Committee mm -hmm. staff, member staff pay the whole nine yards. And do you have any recommendations, not just with that, but you also mentioned uh, cross jurisdictions and how difficult it is, to, one, to just get a committee to develop some level of expertise, mm -hmm. let alone three committees that may have, right. as you said, cross-jurisdiction. Do you have any initial recommendations? That you yeah. Have? Well, I think as, uh, well, I, first I, I uh, think the effort to look at this issue and, uh, and to look at modernization is a good uh, effort, long overdue, and I think it's uh, encouraging that you would do that. Uh, with regard to jurisdictions, I would note Many of the high-risk areas we're putting on the list in the most <clears throat> recent years are ones that involve multiple agencies in the, in the federal government and, and would therefore also cross committee jurisdictions. And I think that uh, the Congress needs to look at having more flexibility uh, in dealing with major issues that cross committee jurisdictions. Right now, there's not an easy way that I see where they've dealt with that. Mm -hmm. The other thing is I think the budget committees have even too narrow jurisdiction over the budget side of things because you have the revenue uh, functions in the different committee, then you have the expenditures, you have a lot of things on fire. So I, I don't think the, um, you know, there, there's a, a need to look at what are the major issues and how Congress can deal with the major issues that cross committee jurisdictions. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes we won't get asked to look at an issue that everybody agrees is important, but it's not in anyone's particular mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. You know, I did a study, and I mentioned these ones I do on my own uh, in authority. I did one. I was concerned about children in poverty, all right? We have one in five children in, in the United States is in po poverty. And what, what's the federal government doing holistically? It co crosses all the committee jurisdictions. One of, and I got a little pushback on, on doing that study, and it was because of <coughs> the jurisdictional concerns that somebody had. I, I was like, of all the issues I study, how could somebody complain? I'm looking <laughs> at children. You know, I mean, so, so but it, it, it's, uh, it's important. So I, I think that uh, if you really want to deal with the big issues, Congress would have to be more flexible than, than dealing with it. And the, the same problems in the executive branch, uh, because they have trouble I mean, it's, it's part of what we do at GAO is look at the fact that, that executive branch agencies that should be working together aren't working together very well. And, and, and that is, you know, a steady stream of work for us. 
in those areas. And so where you have that problem in the executive branch, it sometimes like gets mirrored in the in the committee structure in the Congress, and it prevents <coughs> our government from being fully responsive in those areas. Well, now, you, you need to develop the expertise in the individual areas, mm -hmm. but you need to have something that, in addition, that would supplement that for for big ticket items that cross jurisdictional. So you, you've got a lot of detail in all of these reports, and 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 each each uh, sector or each topic ha has multiple complexities <laughs> that that you have dug into. Help us understand from a, a big a big picture viewpoint or a principle that that or two that you have pulled out of of all of this work that you've done to help us maybe think about what we do differently, not mm -hmm. just on this committee, but as we right. all go off into our other committees. Mm -hmm. is, are there a couple principles that we need to start thinking about with regard to how we manage this bureaucracy? I mean, one, mm -hmm. I'm just so concerned generally about our inability to deal with the challenges at hand. I mean, it's, it's right. cyber, it's China, it's weapon systems, it's 5G, it's mm -hmm. diabetes, mm -hmm. it's 51% of our kids in public schools live in poverty mm -hmm. and all the adverse childhood experiences. And we're just, we seem incapable of pulling together a strategy to, that, that all feeds into solving these problems. And mm -hmm. I don't know many people in government right now that have the breadth of knowledge that, that you have. Mm -hmm. Can you? Can you enlighten sure, us and sure. say what, a couple things that you would want us to know? Sure, sure. Uh, uh, you got 30 two. seconds to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it. Yeah. Uh, We're two. still members of Congress. Uh, we uh, need uh, to uh, talk. Uh, Give us a top line here. <laughs> well, the now, first take thing. Take time because I'd be very interested. In yeah, that. well, the, the first thing I would say, the most difficult part of my job is getting someone and either in the executive branch or the Congress to focus on a problem until it becomes to a crisis proportion, mm -hmm. uh, to plan ahead. You know, we're not very good as a government in doing strategic planning and thinking about things that are, are going to happen. I mean, it was, it's been very clear for a couple of decades that we're going to have this fiscal problem because it's driven by demographics in the country, but yet we haven't done anything to really deal with that problem, we could have taken action a long time ago that would have been less painful than what it's going to take right. at the time. So the federal government's ability, both executive and legislative branches, to identify emerging issues and to, to put in place actions to prevent these things from, from occurring uh, is in need of, of change. And that mindset doesn't exist as much as it <coughs> needs to exist. And it's, it's further exacerbated by constant turnover. You know, in, the, it's a, in the, my job, I've already met with four different VA secretaries, all right, for example. So there, you know, there's a lot of turnover uh, there in the executive branch. There's a lot of turnover in the Congress, too, but there's no institutional way to do planning. That's why you know, GAO really becomes the default for the federal government. Because they have the long-range view, the continuity uh, of, of time with the 15-year appointment for Comptroller Generals. I'm only the eighth in about 100 years. And, and so... Uh, How many more years are you going to last? I have seven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not My, a bad gig. My goodness yeah, gracious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Why don't you propose that new house? 15 year yeah, terms for yeah, Congress. There we go. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I mean, so so that's that's one thing. The uh, the second thing is I don't believe there's an, as much uh, enough engagement with congressional oversight over the executive branch agencies on a sustained basis as there needs to be. I'll be testifying next week on updating our high risk list, which which we do at the beginning of each new Congress. Uh, and we're going to take a couple areas off the high risk list, and and, and 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 invariably, it's been due to congressional uh, uh, help in dealing with forcing the agencies to implement our recommendations. All right, and 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 staying with these issues over time to to deal with them, because we only put the biggest risk on the list, and and they're not easy to solve. So it takes some time and 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 persistent effort. But wherever we uh, see big progress, it's usually uh, congressional intervention is key. 
-hmm. now, but it doesn't happen on a consistent basis mm -hmm. across all these areas. It just doesn't. I think there needs to be, uh, you know, more more dialogue. It can involve not just hearings, but follow up with agency officials later, more detailed uh, legislative directions to the agencies. Uh, you know, Congress in the appropriation uh, bill that just passed recently, the, the larger one that covered agencies, gave some direction to three areas on our high risk list, for, you know, for first time. That's three out of 35, mm -hmm. all right? There's NASA, DOD, and uh, DOE. Uh, and so that's helpful uh, for Congress to, to do this. And so uh, it, so th those two things to me are important. I mean, uh, the most important. One is long range view, uh, and it doesn't even have to be real long range. I'm not talking about, you know, within five, 10 year horizons. You, a lot of these things you can see coming, mm -hmm. right? You know, and, and I, uh, uh, you know, like when I raised, I said earlier, I raised cybersecurity as a, as a high risk area in 1997 across the federal government. It's the first time I ever said anything across the federal government is high risk. I'm still having trouble getting people with this attention to cybersecurity 20 some years later, you know? And it's just, I mean, that's just one example of the type of difficulty. So strategic view, mid, mid long term uh, on these issues and then more diligent and, uh, and rigorous oversight would be the, my two top recommendations. Well, thank you. We're going to have to wrap it up, but I appreciate your time. Thank you for sure. your leadership. Thanks to your, the happy warriors behind you uh, and all their good work. Please let everybody know how much we appreciate it. With that? Yeah. I mean, when you have an Italian-American leading the charge, you're going, to have, <laughs> going to be happy and well-fed, right? This is true. Hearing adjourned. Thank you. Thanks.